Those of us who ride like to think of our motorcycle as the ultimate freedom machine. Just you, your bike and the elements. It's just the freedom feeling, the speed, so the adrenaline pumping. I like the thrill. I'm doing it purely for fun. It's just the places that everybody's been. That just makes for instant friends. Riders take personal responsibility for their safety, and when they don't wear protective clothing, it's usually because it's too hot. Something like 40% of riders will come off and they'll slide. And as long as they don't hit anything, it's a matter of whether they lose a layer of fabric or they lose a layer of skin, and it makes a big difference. But is the gear we need for protection also the right fit for our Aussie summer? It's a compromise safety gear, isn't it? I mean, the more it protects you, the hotter it will be. You try and wear the right thing, but sometimes you also want to be comfortable as well. If I'm going in the shops, it's 10 minutes and it's a hot day, I'm not going to gear up, it's just not worth it. You tend to sort of focus more on how much you're sweating and how tired you're feeling. Yeah, you do tend to lose a bit of concentration on the job at hand. Now scientists are putting motorcycle clothing to the test for both heat comfort and capacity to protect. And the results are surprising. The testing we've done shows that quite a lot of the gear in the market is actually not fit for purpose. That is, it won't protect them in a crash. Their research is vital to improve the safety, comfort and perhaps survival of riders in the future. I guess I'm a bit of a petrol head at heart with a love for motorbikes. Back in the day, they were my main way of getting around, up and down the East Coast, throughout the North, exploring other countries and commuting in the big smoke. I've been riding motorcycles for nearly half my life, but six years ago, I traded mine in for a family wagon and I haven't ridden since. It's good to be back in the saddle. And it seems I'm not alone. The popularity of motorbikes has doubled over the past decade to more than 800,000 riders across the nation. I'm on a road trip to the University of Wollongong to lend my mind and body to a unique study on the impacts of motorcycle clothing. Hello, Liz. Hi, how are you going? Putting me through my paces is fellow biker and safety researcher, Dr Liz de Rome. We selected the 10 most commonly worn suits in Australia and we've tested them for their thermal management properties. And I have to tell you, this was the worst performer. So if, if it was a hot, humid summer's day, uh, the last thing I should be wearing is this. You might not like to be wearing it and the point of the study is to find out whether in fact it's just suck it up, princess, yes, we know it's hot. Yeah. Or if it's actually a safety risk. After a weigh-in and a urine sample to check that I'm hydrated, I'm fitted with a heart rate monitor and thermal sensors. So I'll need to shave in some areas. I hope you don't mind. It just gets better and better. Level height. Out here? Yep. Yep. The sensors will monitor my skin temperature, while this probe delicately squeezed into my ear will measure my body core temperature. Next up, it's time for the gear, including all-season textile pants, socks, heavy boots, and a very warm jacket. This is the fanciest gear I've ever worn before. I'll be doing a series of tests throughout the experiment to monitor my physical and mental state. This one is called the NASA TLX. It's a workload scale. NASA, as in that was developed for astronauts? This, yes, this was developed for astronauts. With snug inner gloves to collect every bead of sweat and my helmet firmly in place, it's time for liftoff to the thermal chamber. Hi, 
Hello, Nigel. Welcome to the chamber. Yeah, I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What we've got set up for you is 35 degrees, 40 per cent humidity. What kind of two-stroke motorcycle is this? Now, this is your two-stroke. It's <laughs> <laughs> Shank's pony, almost. Yes, yes. My reaction time will be tested throughout the study, and after establishing my baseline mental and physical state, we're good to go. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Yeah. And we're off. Target is 60 reps per minute. I'll think of it as 60 kilometres an hour. No. Obviously, we can't have a hot engine in here, so I'm pedalling just enough to replicate the energy I'd use riding a motorbike. Think about yourself as a metronome. Yes. With the fan simulating airspeed of about 30 kilometres an hour, I'll be spending the next 90 minutes under these heaters enjoying the equivalent of a ride around town in 35 degree heat with the sun belting down on me. What could possibly go wrong? As mammals, we regulate our body temperature and we try to keep it within a very narrow window. Uh, we can tolerate an increase of two, three and four degrees. How does the temperature of your body feel now? Uh, 10 hot. 10 hot, okay, thank you. And how comfortable do you feel with that temperature at the moment? Um, no, I'm still slightly uncomfortable too. If it gets too much of an increase or a decrease, then it can create problems. We're going to place Mark under quite a significant physiological strain, uh, and that is him trying to get rid of heat, same time regulate blood pressure. Pedalling slowly like this should be a breeze, but after an hour, I'm really feeling it. How are you feeling? Absolutely buggered. A little anxious about my heart rate. So we're looking at the hot side, which is the hypothermic side. But typically, uh, high heart rate, very high sweating, lightheadedness. And that's due to a drop in blood pressure. These are not things you want to encounter when you're riding a motorcycle. With 20 minutes still to go, I'm really struggling. I'm feeling stress. I'm burning up. Temperature in my body is feeling very hot. In fact, can I say 11.5, nearly extremely hot? I'm drowning in sweat. My heart rate's up to nearly 160, and I'm finding it hard to think straight. My body feels under stress. I, I feel I want to stop. If I was riding a bike right now, I would get off and have a rest. In those conditions, if he also gets dehydrated, which he will do in an hour and a half, then blood flow to the brain will be reduced. When that occurs, his cognitive function can become impaired. He's in a perfect situation to increase his risk of uh, accidents through unexpected occurrences. You can stop. You're kidding me, I can actually stop? You can stop riding. For real? At last, my 90-minute ride from hell is over. And I can feel sweat dripping out from my sleeves and my trousers. OK, here's the acid test. Key to this study is how heat stress affects concentration and reaction time. In this test, I'm trying to spot the target and return to home base as quickly as possible. I was trying to respond to a change in traffic lights or a change in road conditions, and I had to take evasive action that took quick reflexes. I'd really be struggling right now. At this point, I don't care if it's on national television. I can't get my sweat-soaked gear off fast enough. The team weigh everything to calculate how much I've actually sweated. Step up and we'll see how you fared. Oh, well, you've lost um, about one and a half kilos. Oh, my God. The weight's just melted away. <laughs> It'll take a few days to get my full results, so I'm heading further south to meet Dr Chris Hurran. He's testing how bike clothing performs under pressure. First up, denim. The largest injury rate is for abrasion injury. Following that is cut, tear and burst. And these essentially can be fixed by improving the abrasion resistance of a garment. 
with regards to sliding down the road, your clothing is the thing that will protect you. Apart from helmets, Australia doesn't have any standards of its own for motorcycle clothing. Europe sets standards for impact protectors placed inside garments and for materials like para-aramid synthetic fibre, more commonly known under the brand name Kevlar. It's often used inside jeans and is marketed as highly protective. This is really, really risky, but I'm not worried. The European standard says that materials have to stand skidding along this kind of abrasive surface for at least four seconds, running at about 28 kilometres an hour. So let's see how this denim with a protective Kevlar liner lasts. Take it away, Chris. Well, you go, 6.67 seconds. So this would be skid resistant enough to get certification? Yeah, definitely. This would meet the CE level one certification. If we look at Having enough fabric to literally cover your ass and protect your knees, thighs and legs is just as important as the quality of the fabric itself. Material with a loop knitted structure that covers your entire leg will offer the best protection. But how well do the most commonly worn jackets in Australia protect your skin from the road if you happen to come off your bike? Ballistic nylon sounds tough, but is it? 0.25, that doesn't seem quite right. This is supposed to be protective wet weather gear and it's lasting less than half the time than just regular denim. Unfortunately, these are very, very thin fabrics. There's barely 0.4 or 0.5 of a millimetre between you and the road, and it's the thickness of the material that protects you. So they call them ballistic nylon, but if you're wearing one of these without impact protectors, you would be better off wearing a pair of denim jeans. Leather can last up to 15 seconds, but it's variable. This sample only made it to 3.64 seconds. Overall, so-called ballistic nylon was the least skid resistant, followed closely by denim. Leather offered better protection and para-aramid lasted the longest. Is it possible to find a, a jacket that keeps me safe, keeps me looking cool, but importantly, doesn't let me overheat? You can get venting in jackets to help keep you cool. So if you look at a, a sort of a jacket, this one here has venting in a good location. It's an openable flap that gives you air into your, your chest. Now, if your venting's under your arm or in this front area, which is lot, not going to be involved in the impact, that's really good. But if you look at this one, it's actually got venting along the full length of the arm. And so you've got the highest impact point has a vent that can be ripped open with barely any force at all. If I grab that, I could actually rip that apart with my own hands. Our elbows, knees, hips and shoulders are the most vulnerable to impact and need extra protection. You can see here, this one has good protection here and an impact protector, but then in the most important zone, it has a mesh, so there's no protection there at all. Also, be sure to check that reassuring CE certified tag because the protection you're getting may not be where you'd expect. It's not until you turn the, <laughs> the label over and you read the very fine print that you'll find that the garment is only certified for its impact protectors, not for the entire garment. So it would need to have certification for the garment and say that it is for the garment, not just the impact protectors. Now I know how to spot trouble in bike gear, how did I perform in those hot clothes? Do you realise that this is how much sweat you lost in that hour and a half? That's it's amazing. one and a half litres. That's a lot of sweat, but a motorcyclist wearing off-the-rack gear on a hot day in Australia could, could be losing the could, same amount. Could very easily. This is your heart rate, and you were concerned at some points because you could see that your heart rate was increasing. I could feel it. Yeah, yes, and, and you can see that it goes up quite rapidly initially. And it continued to increase throughout the trial, especially when I stopped during my breaks because the fan went off. It's the equivalent of stopping at a traffic light. It just stewed with just, your own juice. And just, yes, exactly. My skin temperature also increased steadily, as did my body core temperature. And I just peaked at 39 at the very end. Another half a degree and we would have had to take you off yeah, the bike because you would have been... Yeah, you, border you hypothermia. Were, you were borderline hypothermia yeah. and that, you know, we would have taken you off because yeah. that's dangerous. Most importantly, the physiological impact of the heat trapped by my clothing 
had a clear effect on my reaction times. I was okay to start with and even improved a bit with effort, but one hour in, I hit the wall and my reaction times tanked. Over the next half hour, they just shot right up and that's when inaccuracies come in too. So this is the, the highest risk area. So here's the thing. Is there a way to improve the quality of protective clothing and increase our desire to wear them without being forced to? A five-star rating system could help consumers make the right choices and encourage manufacturers to improve their standards. It works for car safety and dishwashers, so why not motorcycle gear? Bernard Carlin from the Centre for Road Safety at Transport New South Wales sees the benefits. We're going to put together a system that actually assesses the uh, abrasion, impact and comfort of those clothing items and rate them and then make that available and transparent for consumers so that they can make informed choices about buying goods that actually do protect them. You're going down the stores, a three-star product might be more than sufficient for what you want in protection. Or you're going to go out on a, a ride where you're going down the Great Ocean Road, you're going to want five-star protection because you're going to be doing a lot of cornering and the likelihood of a crash is a lot higher. So you can choose that, you can make that decision. When it comes to what's between our skin and the road, riders need confidence that our gear will not only reduce heat stress and the risk of having an accident, but will protect us if we do.